everybody, welcome to join CGTN's live. Coming at you from the Maritime Silk Road Museum in Guangdong, I'm Jingjing. So this live stream is also another episode of this special project, Tides of Change from CGTN. In the past few weeks, we've traveled to different several coastal regions in southern China, including Hainan province, including Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region, and now we're here in Guangdong province. And this, this place I'm standing right now is actually the Maritime Silk Road in Yangzheng. But you're probably wondering, this doesn't look like a museum, right? This looks like a construction site. Well, it's kind of similar. This is actually the archaeological excavation site. So behind me in this pit, there's a huge shipwreck from 800 years ago during the Song Dynasty. This is the most crucial, most valuable cultural relics of its entire museum. Actually, this museum was built on this shipwreck. So in this live stream, we're going to tell you why this shipwreck is important. So OK, there's a model in front of me. This is what the shipwreck used to look like. It's an amazing, huge cargo. Um, from this side to the other side, this, the length of this shipwreck is about 22 meters. And from this, that side to this side is about uh, nine, over 9 meters wide. So it set sail 800 years ago, carrying tons of porcelains and metals, gold accessories, aimed to do trees along the Silk Road in Southeast Asia, in Arab regions. But unfortunately, it sank. It sank just off the coast of this island to the bottom of the sea. So the discovery of this boat is kind of, it's actually an accident because in 1987, a British exploration company uh, tried to look for a Dutch East, in Dust, uh, Dutch East India shipwreck. But they didn't find that shipwreck. Instead, they found this. Uh, after examining the products inside the ship, and they found, oh, those products dated back to Song Dynasty. So ever since then, the Chinese scientists started this uh, excavation. And now the excavation process has been going on for 34 years. And it still will keep going, keep going for like over two decades, three decades. Uh, so today during this live stream, me and my co-host Matt are going to tell you all these interesting stories about this shipwreck, the, about maritime soup road. And uh, to understand, but like for now, uh, I invited a special archaeologist to tell us the difficulty of the excavation project of this special uh, shipwreck. So right now, let's welcome Mr. Cui Yong, who is in charge of this excavation. Mr. Cui Yong, 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 Mr. So uh, this is Mr. Cui Yong in charge of the excavation. He's been here for quite a long time. 那接下来呢，我们就是麻烦您带我们转一转这一个沉船的遗址，给我们讲讲为什么这个沉船可能是很重要，很棒。那我刚才我我讲解了一下这个船的这个长度以及它的是怎么被发现的，是一个一个巧
This is a preservation pool for the wooden pieces. We're using this cost-effective and high-efficient way to submerge the timbers into the pool, which has chemical compounds. For those fallen pieces of the shipwreck, we will submerge them into the pool. We have a positioning of every single piece of wood. After the preservation, this can all be restored back to where they are. So they put this in the water, so they can protect the wood, and maintain the wood, and don't damage the wood, right? Yes, yes. This can preserve the original status to a very large extent. So that, like those boxes with the special like water, is actually the way to preserve the relics the way it was. Uh, so this is the site that really combines uh, the field excavation and lab excavation, everything all together. Actually, this is like a very deep pit. And behind, like inside those frames, you can see the workers are still cleaning and doing the excavation work. So what I'm going to ask Mr. Sui is like, what are they doing? What is the process now? So they are now working on what kind of work? Since 2009, the hole is still of mud. You can barely see the ship. Since 2017, we have begun a trip of excavation. And we have cleaned up storage of all the relics, which is over. 180,000 pieces. And to protect the shipwreck, we have to clean it up after, before we preserve it. We have deployed the water spray system and to support the timber as a whole structure. And this is a long term preservation is required to support the whole structure. And such preservation will last for almost two decades. But this will not impact the showcasing of the entire project. As you can see, at the very at the edge of the ship. Uh, this is the place where the ship anchors itself. We have 14 cabinets, and every one of this is full of storage. And this is the only direct. This is the only direct way for us to see. Uh, 800 years of shipwreck has a lot of storages of jewels and merchandises. And for it, for, for us to see it as a, as a whole, this is the first time, and we can view it in a very comprehensive way. Therefore, we are making it this way, allowing people to take a look at it from its above. This is such a quite a pre precious archaeology site. It is the most comprehensive uh, evidence to support our research on the maritime Silk Road, right? So far, Nanhai Wan has witnessed the, the entire process of underwater archaeology from beginning to, uh, to glory. And now the excavation process is still underway. Now the water is quite stable and has a quite clear cabinet which are separated. And this can demonstrate China's shipmaking industry has contributed to the whole world. And there are a lot of irons which attach the bows on the shipwreck. 
we can see historic documents saying saying historical documents to prove that. And now this is a visualization of the historical document because you can see that the bones are attached to the water, are attached to the ship, yeah. which is uh, we, quite... Uh, if you look closely over there, there are some, still some bowls and plates from back then attached to the, uh, to, to the structure of the boat. So it's probably very too hard for them to take them all because they will break apart. But that, like, is the most important thing for us to study for the sun, for the historians to study because everything they see now really match what they assume was written in the books. So this is why this is why this is really important. Actually, we can see some workers down there uh, getting the mud out of the ship of the cargo. They're still working. So actually, we are there. We are at this excavation site as they are working. Uh, because I think I assume those mods also come from like 800 years ago. The mud coming from the bottom of the ocean. So I'm gonna ask Mr. Mr. Tui, like what are they doing? What the workers are doing? And why they need to clean the mud? This method applies. We can still see a lot of cultural relics. Although they were buried deep underwater, the cultural relics will still have a function of steering. What we are doing now is not only cleaning up. The mud is not only in the ship, but also beneath it. So this approach is very important to the future judgment of the future uh, discovery of shipwrecks. In the middle of it, the mediary structure, including ship components, which was a very significant source of energy for ships at that period of time. Uh, these this is deployed, this is foldable, so it can also pass it through bridges. We have made a very in-depth analysis of the shipwreck and which uh, would contribute to the future research of underwater archaeology. Uh, Two to three years ago, I've also been here. Uh, and at that time, the plate was there. And we can still see cultural relics, uh, but after two years of here, another visit, we see most of the cultural relics has been cleaned up. I want you to introduce our excavation, how long have it been, and uh, so how soon will it be? I told Mr. Suisley because uh, around two or three years ago, I actually came here. But like two or three years ago, it, it totally looked different because I, all those plates, all those bowls, all the porcelains were still in the cabins, in the boat. And the boat was much bigger back then uh, with less frames. So after two years I came back, I saw the change because all the porcelains are gone, like being took out. Uh, and, though, and also some frames of the ship were also being taken out. So I'm wondering how long do they have to do this excavation? Uh, it already happened like over 30 years. How long you keep going? After cleaning up the cultural relics and making it collected, the external discovery still takes about one year to make it fully finished. But the preservation efforts will take about 30 or uh, 20 years. It is a time-consuming process. We do have cultural relics, and, uh, which is the collection process is 
faster than expectation. Because the depth of this hole is about seven meters, and there are three, three, three uh, two meters deep of mud need to be cleaned up. According to the current speed, it takes one year to clean up all the mud, which means two evacuation uh, excavation seasons. After the cleaning up, we should preserve the body of the ship. This is not only about excavation, it's also about preservation of the cultural relics. I cannot predict uh, when the preservation will end, but I still have a quite clear understanding of how long it takes to execute So it takes almost uh, at least one year to clean up all the mud. And uh, I cannot assure you because if there is more to be discovered underneath the ship, it is not the correct time to write a, write a full stop. It is hard to imagine that the archaeological process takes so long. It takes five to six decades, one or two generations. I would say three generations. And we are the second generation of this exploration. Because the earliest... Uh, I was among one of the first generations. I'm now near my retirement age. Most of my peers were retired. Now it at least takes two generations of people. In the future, it takes several generations as well. It is a time-consuming process. But for this such an important piece of cultural relic, this time is worth spent. Why? The shipwreck has been sunken for almost 800 years. There are ancestors using such a tragic way and inheriting such an important heritage for us. We have to take it carefully and cautiously. Two decades or three decades, it could go long, like more than anybody can expect it. But he says it's really worth it, and it costs at least three generations of people, of historians, of archaeologists, to do this excavation work. But he says it's totally worth it because all those uh, uh, ship crew um, and all those salesmen use such a method, like very heroic way. They sank to the bottom. Some of them probably already lost their lives but they left a huge uh, cultural relics for us, for our generation. The world back then, 800 years ago, and it's uh, important, it will bring us a lot of enlightenment to people nowadays. So that's why the work, work actually, This is not an ideal place, of course. We have a lot of protective gear, protective gears, and the stinky smell comes from uh, corrupt, corrupted sea creatures, and uh, the smell is comes from sulfurs. Mm. And which is a little bit smelly, but we will supervise their air quality. We will improve the air quality to make it basically safe and secure. Mm. 
可能就是这样的环境要不断去适应这样的环境，这是在我们室内。有些像田野也好，实验室也好，可能这样的工作，考古专家这个工作确实挺不容易啊。是。是。您你您做的这个考古工作，您做了多少年 ？How many years have you spent、uh, working as an archaeologist? I started from 1985, and since 1989, I started to work as an underwater archaeologist. I studied it in 1990, 1988, and in 1988, I've done my first underwater、uh, investigation, and it's almost been third, three decades. 八八年，因为刚才说的八八年，我特别想说，因为我是八八年的， oh. 所以说水中国水下考古。I was born in 1988, so China's underwater archaeology is as old as me. You're you're working longer than my life, <laughs>、uh, which means I'm old. <laughs> Which means your experience. Uh, our first、uh, China's first underwater archaeologist investigation was in Guangdong Province. So until now, it's been 33 years. Thank you very much, Mr. Tsui. Mr. Tsui. Here, China's underwater archaeology also started, and his career dedicated in the time that he spent in archaeologists is longer than me existing in the world. Now, Jingjing was just showing you the fantastic efforts going into restoring the Nanhai One, but the restoration is part of the bigger picture. The restoration gives us a window from which we can look through to see what China was like 800 years ago, and also what commerce was like 800 years ago. Now, the ships behind me are representations of the ships that were popular during that time, and they're all built for different purposes. For example, this ship right here is designed more for river travel and to provide opportunity for transport of people.、Um, but the Nanhai One had a very special purpose. It was a type of ship called a fu, and this is a fairly accurate representation of the type of ship that the Nanhai One was. Now, Jingjing was showing you what the current state today is of the Nanhai One, but. There's a bigger picture if you can look at this model and see what it looked like before it went down. Now, what Jingjing was showing you in the pit was just about the just about the hull from this point down, and from this point in the front, all the way to the back. And what that does is it offers you an interesting perspective into a very important part of the ship. It was divided into 15 segments. Each segment was full of products that were destined for locations along the Maritime Silk Road. We're going to actually talk about those products and look at some of the products that came off the ship a little bit later. But let's look at the ship that we cannot see. Let's look at parts of the ship that were lost to history. The Nanhai One was lost on the entire top deck. We lost the forward section. We lost the sails. And the the mastheads, and we also lost the crew quarters, where you probably had sailors and, of course, the all important captain who was guiding the Nanhai One on its journey. The other thing that we lost was the、uh, rudder. The rudder of the ship is what allows the ship to, to guide through the water, and the wreckage that is being restored on the other side of the museum. Actually, you can see parts where the rudder would be accepted into the main ship. 
So there's all sorts of interesting things that when you look at the wreckage, you can understand what was used to build it and what it was used for, but you can also compare it to what it looks like or what it should have looked like way back then. One more funny thing is, is this. I found this very interesting. This is an eye, <laughs> and in that time, uh, eyes were placed on the front of ships, uh, and they were kind of intended as a use to provide some forward-looking vision to the ship itself so that the, the sailors and the, and the captains could depend on the eyes of the ship to guide it on its path. Now, the, the products and the goods that came off of the Nineha One each tell stories themselves. A lot of the products, because they were buried in such thick mud, muck, and at a constant temperature, at a constant depth, were kept in such pristine shape that they look almost like they would 800 years ago. So they were able to take a lot of these products off the ship and we can look at what sort of designs, what sort of styles were intended to supply products up and down the Maritime Silk Road. Now, one of the major components of the commercial goods on the ship destined for uh, sale all up along the Maritime Silk Road was porcelain. In China, porcelain is a very, very important commodity and one of the uh, kilns that supplies a lot of the porcelain that was aboard the Nanhai One came from Jingdezhen. Jingdezhen is a very famous city and it's famous for porcelain. Uh, the China, China it's called, <laughs> Chinese China. And on this bowl, you can kind of see um, some of the indications of what was important back then, the value in the design itself. As a, an example, this bowl here has an image of two young children and two pomegranates into the surface of the bowl. And what that signifies is fertility and children. And uh, in that time, if you had children, it was a very lucky thing. It was, it was a sign of prestige. It was, it, it was a, 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 the message that you can get from a lot of the designs in the bowl give you an idea of what people thought was very important. And at the time, you know, having a lot of kids was an extremely uh, important thing during 800 year ago China. Now we're going to walk to a map here. We're going to meet a guest, Chen Yana. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. How are you? Very good. Very good, very good. She's a little nervous, but that's okay. <laughs> She's going to show us a map. Now tell me uh, what these points on the map show and tell me a little bit about this map. Okay. The majority of ceramics from Nahai Wan are from five kills. But the Jindezhen kill of Jiangxi province, Longchuan kill of Zhejiang province, and Yi kill, Dehua kill, Cizhao kill of Fujian province. And here is Quanzhou, which is believed to be the port of departure of Nahai Wan. So the products from different kills were transported to Quanzhou and shipped to different areas. Yeah. So. The Nanhai One probably loaded full of goods from Quanzhou, departed along the southern edge of China. And then right around here, this is Hailing Island, this is right where we are right now and where the museum is, 38 nautical miles south, southeast? Yes. Southeast. Uh, it went down. Now nobody knows why it went down. Uh, currently scientists and engineers are trying to figure out why the ship went down and hopefully we'll find some answers. But you know what? History sometimes is a mystery. And sometimes just trying to understand why it went down is part of the magic of history. Along this coast, you have all sorts of different kilns. Now, Jingdezhen is one of the most famous uh, cities uh, for porcelain in China. But there's many kilns along the coast here that supply different sorts of products that went into the Nanhai One. And the interesting thing is, each city, each kiln, has its own personality. And yeah. so Chen is going to show us a little bit about the different personalities that you can see embedded in the different products that were brought up from the Nanhai One. So let's go take a look. Okay, so we have some plates here with some really beautiful designs. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the edge looks very strange. Why is the edge of these plates uh, look different? Yes, you can see there is no glaze on the rim. 
because in ancient times, when people fire them, they put them upside down, mm -hmm. so they cannot put the grates on the rim. It's a different kind of firing ceramics. But when they were sell to other countries, people might put some gold or silver on it mm. and make it look more beautiful. Yeah, I've seen some of these plates before, actually. Along the edge here, they will plate it with some sort of a precious metal. And it actually becomes quite, quite beautiful. So it's kind of interesting. They, they fire it that way because it's the easiest way to fire it. But then later, somebody can coat it and it can become something even more precious and beautiful. Okay, let's go on to the next. Yeah, here are also some very little balls. Yep. They are also very beautiful and look like flowers. Now the glaze, obviously, these bowls are still shiny. The, the shine was not added, right? This is, this is the way that they came off the ship. And the reason is because all of that mud preserved it. Yes. And so in many cases, archaeological digs like this, you cannot get products kept in this pristine condition. So this is quite special. Now, different kilns and different places that produce pottery produce different products, yes. right? So let's take a look at these products and what kiln did they come out of and what made this kiln special in its own right? These are from Longchuan Kiln. And we just said that Jingde Zheng's products are very thin, but products of Longchuan's body are thicker than them and they also have a thicker blade. So if you look at this plate, yeah. it looks like there's water. Yeah, but yeah. It almost looks like you could wash your hands in it. <laughs> yeah. But in fact, there's no water. In yeah. It. That is a very, very heavy coating of glaze. And so each kiln has its own styling and its own, yes. its own taste of, of products. But these were no less valuable than the Jing De Gen ones, right? They were yes. also very, very well sought after products yes. as a representation of porcelain in China. Yeah. The designs also tell us a story of some of the inspiration that came from the designs. As a matter of fact, if you look at the, uh, the picture on the back, a lot uh, looks like a sand dollar. Now, I used to find these sand dollars on the beach in different places. And the second that I saw that plate above, uh, right here, I said, wow, that looks exactly like a sand dollar. So sometime in the past, an artist sat down and sketched out a design and conceptualized a design and said, you know what, I'm going to make this sand dollar into a beautiful piece of porcelain that will in turn travel all around the world. A lot of this stuff found homes all around India, Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and it was used to kind of spread the culture throughout the world at the time. Come on, let's take a look at another piece, uh, maybe over here, yeah. and then work our way back. Now these are larger bowls, eh? Yes. And what kiln do they come out of? These are from Dehua Kiln. Dehua Kiln. Yeah. And maybe they will show to other countries for hemp life. Hemp life? Yeah. To heat to eat the rice okay. by hand. By hand, by hand. Okay, so th these people didn't have, weren't using chopsticks as much, weren't using yeah. utensils. These were bowls used to maybe mix rice with some vegetables and some meats and then, yes. and then use your hands to eat it. Do you like eating with your hands? Uh, not used to it. <laughs> I, I went to India once and I had to eat with my hand. I actually really liked it. <laughs> it's very easy. When you can just grab it, it's good stuff. Okay, so now we're looking at some porcelain for some other types of daily life, right? So these are some feminine products, like for makeup, right? Yes. And also these pots here. Can you tell us a little yeah. bit about them? If you look at them, it looks like the metal pot. Yeah. Maybe from Arabian yeah. area. In fact, maybe they modeling the metal wares. Yep. So maybe they were ordered especially by the foreigners. Yeah. Now, obviously, we don't know 800 years ago. We're not sure. But, but you can look at the style of these pots and these, uh, these, the, 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 the designs, and you can say, wow, these designs must have come from far away from China in order to create this. Now, these actually are, are for makeup, right? For, yes. for blush or, I mean, I don't know so much <laughs> about makeup, but maybe you can help me a little bit. So what, what do you think was in here, and uh, where do you think they might have been headed? Maybe some makeup or some power, mm. uh, different kinds. Because uh, when we found the box, some of them are empty. Yeah. And some of them were separate into different sessions. Yeah. So they can put different types of makeup things Maybe in there. Maybe different colors or pigments. Yes. Or very, very interesting. 
They look pretty big. My, now girls have little compacts, you know, little plastic ones. Yeah. <laughs> Back in the day, you know, they throw it in their pocket. But yeah, these were quite very big. Very similar to yeah. these. <laughs> okay, what do we got here? Now, this is interesting because these, these are uh, smaller, more intricate little um, um, containers. Yes. And they have smaller, more intricate little containers inside the smaller, more intricate containers. So can you tell us what was, what was this about? Because that's the, they want to use the space. Yeah. So they want to put as much as possible on the ship. Yeah. So they put a little one in a relatively big one. Mm. You know what's funny? As I remember when I was a kid, my mom used to clean up all my toys. And I had a lot of Legos, and my mom used to put all of my Legos inside some of my bigger toys to yeah. store them together. So, like, I can understand the theory behind it, uh, using every every stitch of space to store as much product as you can. Because a lot of these ships, once they loaded from China, they were destined for a long period of time on the ocean, and so they had to have enough goods to distribute all along the Maritime Silk Road. In a lot of cases, you told me yesterday that a lot of these ships would be lost in many cases. So you have to load up as much product as you can in attempts to distribute as much as, it is, as possible because sometimes a ship would get lost a lot yes. like the Nanhai One. Um, what is this? Now, now, these look like metal. They look like copper. But, but they're ceramic. But they're not, you know. <laughs> what, what was used, what technique is this and, and what was, how, how are they special? Well, they are also copying the metal wares, but in also you look at the green, the glaze is green. It looks like the copper mm. because they have lead in the glaze. So when the lead is fired in a lower temperature, it will turn green. Mm. But since it's fired in lower temperature than those ceramics we just saw, so the color will fade. Mm. So the, some of them are turning gray. It's kind of interesting what people used to do to try to create uh, a replica of some other technique. They were trying to create a look of copper, and so they were incorporating lead into the production method for that pottery. But lead is toxic. Yes. So I'm hoping that people weren't eating off of those plates, because if they were... <laughs> Maybe they were, it's for decoration. Hopefully. <laughs> hopefully they used candles. So hopefully they were for, for candles. Now, now this is very interesting. These, these are... Uh, containers that would normally hold maybe some, maybe some chingzhou, bai, yeah, yeah, maybe, some, maybe some baijiu. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about the markings at the yeah, top. Yeah, that, uh, that is some characters. And this is Wu Zihao. In fact, in Naha Wan, we also find some big drafts with different characters. Mm. One says Yu Ye Chun. Maybe yeah. it's the name of a white brand. Yeah. You know what's funny is that you can see these inscriptions on a lot of the products that you found on the Naihai One, and you have to make up theories, right? Is this was this the person who uh, produced the the, uh, the the alcohol? Was this the person that produced the jar? Who knows? You know, so you kind of it's kind of like an investigation. You know, yeah. we're all trying to figure out to to solve the mystery of what these uh, these were used for now. I was thinking, wouldn't it be interesting if one of these still held some baijo? <laughs> I wonder what that baijo would have tasted like. 800 years. Maybe it's bad. <laughs> maybe it would be vinegar, but maybe it would be like super tasty baijo. You know, 800 year old baijo. That would be a very expensive uh, <laughs> set of baijo. Now, on the other side, this is kind of an interesting side as well. Just, just we'll touch on that and then we'll go back. Now, Underneath, these are where all the all the cargo was, right? Yes. So these would be full of porcelain, uh, stacked together and probably uh, packed with with grasses or some sort of stuffing to make sure that they don't move around. Now, in the Nanhai One, it was kind of interesting because the porcelain, when you're on a ship, okay, I, I used to live on a ship oh. in, in in America, and when the waves would go, the plates would go. <laughs> and it was, it, you want to make sure to cut down on as much movement as possible. Obviously, packing is important, but when you're on the ocean, that ship could be moving in a lot of different directions. So the packing of the Nanhai One, they put the porcelain at the bottom. Yes. And then above it, they put metal goods like nails and, and ironware. Iron what? Ironware. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of interesting because normally you'd want to put the heavy stuff at the bottom. 
But in this case, they wanted to put the porcelain at the bottom so that it wasn't moving around and potentially breaking. Yeah. Kind of interesting. And then, of course, the crew quarters and, the, and potentially people living on the boat. We don't know how many people were on the boat uh, at the time, but they would be living above deck going about their daily life. Now, porcelain, um, through Jing Dezhen and some of the major kilns, were very, very fine, right? They were very, very high quality, and so they were very expensive. But the Nanhai One was designed to deliver products to all sorts of different customers. Some of them could afford higher-end stuff, and some of them could afford more economical stuff. So these yeah. are more of the types of pottery that would be more of the economic variety, right? Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about wh where, where, would it, where did these come from? Uh, these are from the EEL, EQ e okay. of Jian. So if, as you can say, they're not, not as bright as those of Jin Dezhen Q. Yep. And the body is not as fine as the Jin Dezhen Q. Yeah, the polishing is, yeah. is a little bit uh, not as good. And uh, just you could tell just the color is, is a lot more simple. Yes. Um, it, you know, in Jing Dezhen, actually, if you have a very fine piece of pottery, you can actually hold it up to the light and you can see the design of the pottery through because the Jing De Zhen is specialized in making such fine and thin pottery that the walls are almost as thin as paper in some cases and, and very, very fragile. So actually transporting these was probably a lot easier than transporting some of the fragile Jing De Zhen products. Here we have some more of the, of the uh, more EQ, economical. Yeah. And then at the end here, the next case, I'd like to show that. These are uh, the uh, bottom of different sorts of bowls and plates, and they, they had, are these the original inscriptions? Yes. They almost look they've been, like they've been written with a marker. It's so interesting. I mean, that's incredible. People write it with the ink. With the ink, yeah. That is why when you sign your signature, you have to use the black. Oh, you're right, right, yeah. right, right. And then they're fired, and once they're fired... Uh, no, the... they were written after the fire. Really? Yes. Wow. Because the ink can last for a long time. Uh, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what are, what are these? Are they names? Are they companies? Um, what is the theory? Uh, many guesses. Yeah. Maybe it's the name of the owner, or maybe it's the name of the factory that, which made them. Maybe some of them may indicate the usage of uh, this thing. Okay. I mean, I always like, it's like these pieces are talking to us today yes. from 800 years ago. So somebody sat down and wrote something. Could you imagine somebody writing a note and thinking 800 years from now, somebody is going to be reading what I wrote? I mean, it's pretty incredible. And to think about the fact that we're, you know, you're taking care of this at the museum and making sure that these messages continue to speak to people even today. It's pretty cool. So we have, like, obviously the restored and preserved relics from the Nanhai One, but you also have some really interesting technology em employed in the museum that allows us to peer back into time and see, you know, some more intricate details of the products that came off of the ship and the ship itself. For example, let's see, is it this one, right? You touch right. this screen. We now just this, saw. <laughs> yeah, we had just seen this. This is where the the larger uh, uh, drum was holding more different, uh, larger barrel was holding more little pieces inside. So if you touch this, you can actually see <laughs> the smaller uh, little vases pop out of the larger one. And this is kind of interesting. Like it's, it's so incredible that we have this historical uh, wreck that is so old with such interesting, intricate products on it, and we can go through and use current technology to inform ourselves, teach ourselves, and, I mean, also entertain. Like, this is entertaining, and if we can entertain ourselves and learn at the same time, that's a win-win to me, right? So we can go back and we can look at all the different sorts of intricate designs and details, and then we also have the information here that tells us about it. I mean, this museum is more than just showing you, it's informing you about the different stuff on the ship. So it's very, very cool. This is more daily life stuff. So we have, you know, the gold bracelets. Bracelet. Yeah, very and, beautiful. And mirror. the mirror. For daily use. There's no mirror anymore. <laughs> Long since gone. But, I mean, these were like giving you an idea of what life was like. And then this is the, the piece of the silver, silver, right? This is very interesting. I don't know. I don't think Jing Jing was talking to you about it in this live stream, but this was 
one of many silver bars that came off of the wreckage. And it's very corroded, but if you were to get rid of this and cut it in half, it'd be shining silver underneath. Quite beautiful. So now let's go to a mural here and, and take a look at um, this beautiful mural. Now, this is actually quite interesting as well. I, uh, I, I looked at this, and art uh, kind of is a window as well. Just like the shipwreck is a window into another time, a piece of art is a window into another time. And so this is a very, who painted this? This is a fairly beautiful piece of artwork. It was painted by three person. Three people worked three together people. to paint this. Yeah, it shows the some shift here. Yeah. The bigger one and smaller one. Because some port, the sh water is not deep enough. Yeah. So they have to use the smaller one to transship the goods. Well, so if this was the non high one, it was fully loaded with porcelain. A lot of it was very deep. It would draft a lot of water. They call that drafting water. So it wouldn't be able to come all the way to shore. So they used to have to have smaller sh ships that would go up and then either take or or supply more to the main cargo ship. So this is this picture depicts what that area looked like way back then to supply products to the Nanhai one and in turn to supply products all up and down the Maritime Silk Road. I see somebody over here though that I'm gonna invite. Hello. Come on over. Hi. Come on over, Jing Jing. Take a look at this. <laughs> Take a look at this. Did you see this gigantic ship? You're on the ship. Yeah. You're on the ship. That was like I was imagining myself as one of the crew members of the ship 800 years ago, yeah. standing here, set sail to go along the Silk Road. Yeah. And looking at this picture, I mean, imagine this is the yeah, vast yeah. ocean. You know, right? if you were on the ship and you were in, the, in a bay, uh -huh. you could literally look out and see something like that. Yeah. You know? And I think we, we both love oceans and yeah. we enjoy boats, like cruise and yachts. And we do a lot of live streaming on the yacht, yeah, on yeah, different, yeah. like a dive, scuba diving, yeah. jumping from a boat. This, like, we, if we lived 800 years ago, we probably could be one of the crew members. Yeah, you Hello, know what? Crew? Maybe, maybe you know, I was once a, a sailor reincarnated a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on here? Hold on. Okay. All right, that's better. No, that's better. no, right. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Let me stand. All right, all right. Now we're even. Okay, now we're okay. even. Now this looks better. Yeah, right, yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Finally, I'm I'm taller than you, Matt. During at least during one video. <laughs> one, one video. Live. One video. <laughs> Okay, so, so how's your trip? It was fantastic. I mean, I'm I'm actually been, this is my last live stream with mm -hmm. CGTN. I'm going to be going back to uh, back to Ningbo and, and traveling, you know, on my own. But it's been really amazing. I mean, the whole crew here at CGTN is fantastic. Mm -hmm. You can't see beyond the camera, but there is some some really interesting, good uh, good good folk here working for CGTN, and and and, and then there's Jing Jing. Yeah, <laughs> so the hair toss. With my hair again. And, uh, <laughs> so, it's I don't been know a how many pleasure. times I did this. Sorry. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, All right, I let's go. I did so many times to believe my hair. Yeah. <laughs> I hope my so, boss is okay with this. <laughs> I hope maybe in the future I can do another one of these, uh, one of these series with CGTN. Uh, you know, part of um, doing these kind of series is also mm -hmm. teaching you guys about the world around you, and especially mm -hmm. China and its importance, and also kind of sharing some interesting facts. And yes. in, the, in, this, in this is since we're sharing the history, you know, and and. The Nanhai One is a really interesting relic that's been able to be recovered in such an interesting way. Yeah, I mean, exactly. we just show, you showed us the actual hull, you know, and I, I was watching it, like the mud and everything. I mean, that's it's still yeah. going today. It's going to continue to go until they're finished, you know. I mean, and uh, I learned today from today's live stream that the archaeologist told me that, like, you know, the China underwater archaeology in China starts in the year 1988. The same age as me. Really? Yeah, and he started this his work uh, in, around the year '85, mm -hmm. and he's about to retire the next year. So he spent his entire life, his entire career in underwater archaeology. Wow! And um, so many times like, I asked him because this has already been going for like 34 years. Yeah. 34 years, and it will continue to go probably another 20 years. 20 more years. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, well, approximately. Luckily, yeah. because if they find more uh, right, crossings, right. they would take uh, like even longer. Yeah. So, and uh, he estimated they probably need three generations of scientists, of uh, archaeologists, to do this work. But it's only worth it because those people 
who were on the boat yeah. sacrificed themselves 800 yeah. years ago, left such a huge relics uh, for us to study, to study about the maritime uh, Silk Road, about how the world, how different countries connected, like a thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. And maybe it will be an important lesson for people nowadays. It's got to be an exciting job, though, too. Yeah. I mean, like, like there's something about discovery mm -hmm. and something about digging into history that's exciting. And, and underneath the mud, being able to take something and pull it out and say, no one has seen this in 800 years, and I can tell its story is pretty amazing. And that's what this whole museum is about, telling the story of the Nanai Wall. Exactly. So everybody, I hope you enjoyed today's live stream. Yeah. So this live stream will be the last one for me and Matt. But it won't be the last for Tides of Change. So keep following yeah. CGTN, keep following Tides of Change. They will continue to bring you more interesting stories in different coastal regions in yep. China. And if you're on Doing, check out Jayo Mata. <laughs> Put it yourself <laughs> Sorry, again. sorry, I had to do it. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you, you for so watching. Much. Okay, <laughs> bye. Bye-bye.